Hey YouTube, this is TCA Gaming. I know it's been a while since I've done a video. Um, it's mainly been because I've made a lot of purchases lately, mainly of um, collections. It seems a lot of people are trying to sell out, and they have been. So I've just been buying what I can, trying to sell it, sort it. If you followed me on eBay, then you know that I've been listing stuff like crazy, sealed product, singles, basically anything that I can. So in this video, I'm not going to show too much of that stuff. I'm actually just going to go through one of my PSA to grade boxes. And uh, I don't know how many cards in here. There's several hundred. I'm just going to go through all this stuff that I have lined up to go to PSA. And this is just one of five boxes that I've made here and there, finding cards, thinking that they're mint, and just putting them in penny sleeves or a regular sleeve and a card saver. So we'll just go through this video now. So these are some old school EX cards. Right now this is uh, looks like Emerald. And then we have got some from Unseen Forces. Really for me, I, I, I pretty much always have a lot of stuff at PSA. I have a lot of stuff lined up. If I had, I, don't, I guess it would be like at least fifty thousand dollars or more I'd probably send everything that I have lined up just to just to put it on out there but it just takes them so long to get stuff graded sometimes I've had some bulk submissions only take a few days and then I've had some take a lot longer than that but I actually had a pack submission recently take 116 business days I mean it was nearly half a year that they had the package there I really like this era. The cards are getting harder and harder to find in good condition, but you can still find them right now. So if you're um, if you're into collecting these, you might want to snag them up before the last mint copies all get graded or put into someone's collection. Even the regular sets are starting to shift in price. I recently had someone who purchased all 16 of the regular sets, so that didn't include any reverse hollows. Did not include any of the EXs, the gold stars, none of that stuff. It was like forty-two hundred bucks or something. So I mean that averaged what between two and three hundred dollars a set. And that's hard to bring on the old stuff. Well, what is that? I think one of my daughter's toys just randomly went off over there on the side. It happened once, so it might happen again. Kind of sounded like a, a character from uh, Trolls, maybe Poppy. I've watched that movie so many times. If there's a, if you see a card in this video that you think you're looking for for your collection and you know a particular grade, I mean, you're more than welcome to send me a message, and uh, I'll try to add you to a list of people to reach out to if the card comes back at the grade that you're looking for or higher. But I do not know specifically when these cards are going to grade. This is actually the fifth box that I have. So this stuff is behind four other boxes. And to give you an idea of how many cards are here, um, if you have ever heard of the shoe box, by B they're made by BCW. They're to hold um, graded cards. I think they hold roughly six to 800 cards in a card saver and this one's almost full. I'm going to show you guys all of these cards in this video but that means it's behind four other boxes probably with at least 2,500 cards and I imagine that's probably on the low side because I pack them in pretty good and tight and this is the card saver one. I think it's actually meant to hold the card saver two which is a little bit bigger so I imagine it's a little bit thicker. If you're wondering what's in the background right there, that is four Neo Series boxes. You've got Neo Genesis in the top left. Bottom left is Neo Discovery, Neo 2. Bottom right is Neo 3, Neo Revelation. And then the top right is Neo Destiny, Neo 4. I think I've actually got these up on sale for eBay. Something like $16,000. It's, 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 it's definitely a little bit overpriced. The... Um, 
I think I valued the Neo Genesis at like 3,000 or something. Neo Discovery 3,000. Neo Revel Revelation probably 5,000. And then Neo Destiny at four or five. I think 5,000 as well. So it was probably 16K that I was looking to get. Because I figured that was high end retail. Probably over retail on all those. But they're all together. They're all legit. And they're all sealed. And these boxes are definitely getting harder and harder to come by. If you um, try to find Neo boxes, you know that the easiest one to find is definitely Neo Discovery. And then after that, probably the Neo Genesis. Neo Destiny and Revelation, they're both really hard to find. Neo Destiny is more sought after just because it's the last one and it has all those extra shinings in there. But Neo Revelation is just as hard to find in my opinion. What you're seeing now is probably some of the, the higher end cards from the video. Um, these are all the gold stars. I think all of the one of each should be in this collection here. And of course, these will all get sent off. And I expect high grades from all this stuff. Every one of these cards seem to be either pack fresh or really well hand picked. The only ones that I, I I added myself from a it was like a secondary collection that I don't think would get uh, a nine or ten I believe it was the Umbreon and Espeon Gold Star. Which a lot of these have curvature issues, especially like the Deoxys um, set stuff, the Requaza, Latios, Latias. So I mean, I don't I'm not gonna be pissed at. PSA if they give me an 8 on something, but hopefully they won't. An 8 still a really high grade if you think about it. It's a near mint mint rating from a professional. Then it looks like we also have next up the level X is kind of pro progressing through the uh, sequence of release. can't remember how many sets in total were for the Diamond and Pearl era. You started off with this uh, Diamond and Pearl base set, and I think it was like Mysterious Treasures, and you got Great Encounters, and here's Majestic Dawn. After Majestic Dawn, I believe it was, uh, it was Legends Awakened. After Legends Awakened, you moved into Stormfront. Let me get this handful into the next box that I'm putting these in. Pull them out of one, put them in another. It wasn't really like the EX series. I mean, I guess in a, in a way the EX series was split up. Cause, but the EX series, you had the the first four, which were te technically e-reader sets. They had the reverse holographic. You had the uh, Ruby and Sapphire, which was the first set. Then you went into Sandstorm, then into EX Dragon. And then EX Team Magma and Team Aqua. And then after that, they transition to the parallel hollow, which is where they're holographic in the picture. And um, a lot of them had the, the set logo in the, the bottom corner. And people still call those reverse hollows, but really it was like a parallel hollow because the holographics even had that. But with the Diamond and Pearl series, it's, it technically ended with, I think it was with Stormfront, which is the set you're looking at now. And then after that, it went into Platinum, which was still part of the fourth generation, which is Diamond and Pearl. But it started off with the Platinum base set, which is this one. Actually, this is Supreme Victors. This isn't the Platinum base set. You had a um, Platinum base set. You had Platinum Supreme Victors. You had Rising Rivals. I think Rising Rivals was before Supreme Victors. And then after uh, the last one was Platinum Arceus, if I remember correctly. There were four Platinum sets. And this is Platinum base set. Now this one, this Dialga, I believe it was this one, actually had a variant that has an electrical fire energy. So it's yellow instead of red. It should be in this video as well if I had it at the end of these. Once you get past the Platinum series, it's still technically Diamond and Pearl. But that's where you go to the... Uh, I can't remember if it was Call of Legends first or Heart Gold Soul Silver. But Call of Legends was a standalone set. So yeah, I believe it was Arceus, Platinum Arceus, and then you go into Heart Gold Soul Silver base set. And then there was another three after that. You had Unleashed, Undaunted, and Triumphant. 
and then Call of Legends was the very last set in Generation 4. This was a, a big player card. I, I don't recall seeing it to me in the World Championship decks, but people liked using it. Snorlax level X. You put it onto Snorlax, so you did have to evolve it. But if you look at its Poke Power, Big Appetite, once during your turn, if Sna Snorlax is your active Pokemon, you may draw cards until you have six cards in your hand. If you do, Snorlax is now asleep and it can't be used if he's affected by a special condition. So, if you could just wake him up, you could draw until you have six cards in your hand every turn. It's kind of like the uh, Shaman that allows you to draw until you have seven cards in your hand, but it's just when you set him down the first time. That could be something that was repeated every turn. Of course, the card that came before Shaman EX that everyone was crazy about was the... Uh, that Azelf, or no, it's the Uxie from Legends Awaken that had this special ability that when you set it on the bench, oh wait, here's that era, the Alga. See, it's got the electric type fire energy. But it allowed you to draw up until you have seven cards in your hand instead of the six, which Shaman did. This is the, you got the Poke Body, and the other one is a Poke Power, so that's the era version. Also, we have the promos. That Uxi is still pretty expensive today just because it's so powerful. You don't take, your opponent will not take two prizes from Uxi and um, you get to draw a whole extra card from it. That was the big drawback to Shaman EX. It only had 110 HP, but because it was an EX, when, you, when it got knocked out, your opponent took two prizes for it. So really, it was a liability once you used its ability. Now, once we get through some of this sequential stuff where we're going through each of the sets, after this we'll move into, uh, I believe, the primes. Um, I do have a, a, good, a good couple stacks of just random stuff that, as I've been picking it up, I've been throwing it in these card savers thinking, hey, that's probably going to get a 9 or a 10. Let me grade it. So the primes, it doesn't say prime there, but that's what basically a lot of people call these. This is Blissey Prime. But the card itself's name is only Blissey, so for card effects, you didn't have to worry about Prime being in the name of it. But uh, these were short lived. It was for the Heart Gold Soul Silver set, uh, series, base set, all the way through Triumphant. And then I believe after you went to Call of Legends, that's, um, they did away with those and they had the shinies, which were similar. They had the silver borders, but they were much more attractive. For collectors and they're definitely a lot more rare. It might just be because the Call of Legends set wasn't as heavily printed. I really do not know. I've never looked up the numbers on that kind of stuff. But for the most part, primes, they're pretty cheap. I think the most expensive one you're going to find is a new. You get it still for about 10 bucks. At one time you could get every single one of the primes. I think there's 27 of them for like under 50 bucks. I mean it was, it was like super cheap. A lot of these were used in decks that won the World Championship. Like I know the Yen Mega was, Don Fan, I believe Celebi was as well. Can't remember who else. I know a guy who <coughs> collected the, the Gengar Primes. I believe Magnazone was in one of the World Championship decks. And there's the Mew. Of course, people want that one the most just because it's Mew. There were a few promos that went along with it. Heart Gold, Soul Silver. Of course, you had the Neo 2 starters, then you also had the Neo 2 dogs. And after that, these were much more popular in the Heart Gold Soul Silver series. You had the Half Art Legends. So, like this is from Heart Gold Soul Silver base set. And for these, technically the cards are like that, and the symbol is still in the bottom right hand corner. But really to get their full effect you gotta a lot of people call them half hearts I mean you gotta put both cards together and really I, I like the artwork I think it, it's fairly epic especially for what had been done up until this point but the legends really never made a comeback they were around for the heart gold soul silver series and then that was it they actually had jumbos which were one big card they weren't done in the half arts. Those were nice and really quite popular. 
as you can see a lot of these are repeated or just kind of like where they take the Pokemon and mix them up a little bit there we go and this does not look to be like Call of Legends, but maybe a bunch of Charizard full art EX EXs from Flashfire that I had uh, set to be graded. I'm not sure how many I put in here. Let's see. Uh, so there's a, some more. These are all the full art Charizards from Flashfire. Looks like there's still some more. Hopefully you won't get too bored looking at all these Charizards from Flashfire. I just like the artwork. I mean, it, was the, it was the first textured full art Charizard. So to me, it was one. It was an iconic card. It definitely represents Flashfire. It's got good artwork. For the most part, they were printed with decent quality. The bad thing is, I think I still got more somewhere else. Still more here. The Charizard EX, the XY121, I remember buying a ton of those things. I set back like 720 of them or something. Just I bought two of those 360 binders you know, where you've got the side load and it's uh, 20 pages and you put 18 on each page. So it's 360 cards and I filled up two binders all the way front to back with them. I just thought it looked cool. And that was right near release. So they weren't really that expensive. You'd be surprised, but um, at that time you could get them for about four bucks a piece. Even now, I mean, you can still find them for four dollar, four to five dollars. I mean, they're not super expensive. These, I think, I think these are about twenty, twenty-five dollars for a near mint copy. You might be able to find them for cheaper. All right, so we're getting into a few new things here. Looks like some. Some black star promos and anytime you see promos like this from me I probably have hundreds more on back stock that are in just as good a shape as these but the way I try to do it so I don't overwhelm myself with trying to put a thousand ho-ohs or something like that into PSA graded cases what I do is I get a stack and then every time I run out I'll grab four or five and I will put them in PSA card savers and set them back to be graded and then the rest I'll sell for the the cheap price even though they're pretty much all the same card most most all of them could be graded and get a good get a high grade or a premium value but you can't grade everything if you have a thousand of something it's going to take you so long to sell a thousand PSA graded cards I mean it's not going to be worth it to me it's worth it to sell out a few of them at a lower valuation make some money on that and then use that money to pay for the grading on the others I believe I got these birthday Pikachus from a guy who traded me in Australia. Same thing with the Scythers. You see, I actually have sealed packs of 25 of the Scyther. But I mean, I still stuck a few over here to be graded. Because that's kind of, for me, that's always worked. Just siphoning a little bit here and there off of um, collections that I purchase and send that stuff off to PSA. And when I make money on that, I use that money to, to grade some more cards or something like that. If you send everything to PSA, there's going to be so much stuff you lose your money on. you got to be really selective, and you don't need 50 of a certain card graded unless it's the Charizard first edition, of course. I mean, you want to grade all those. But something like this, where the card itself is only 5 bucks or so, if you get a PSA 10, yeah, you might pull 20, 30 bucks out of it. Maybe even 40 or 50 a few times, but you're not going to do it 10, 20, 30, 40 times. Even if you have that many in PSA 10. I remember I used to sell the number 40 and 41 Lucky Stadium and the Pokemon Center. PSA 10, I would sell them for $50 right when I started doing this stuff. And they would sit because I had so many of them. I'd put them all on the market and they would just sit. Now the ungraded copies, of course, I mean, they're worth like 200 bucks a piece. But back then, I would literally buy hundred, hundreds of each of those at a time for about $5 a piece. There were there were not many people on the market, so I mean to me that was a good price because I'd turn around and I'd sell them for roughly twenty dollars a piece. Looks like 
got some first edition Flames Charizard, some more Gym Challenge first edition holographics. What I'll most likely do with stuff like this is if say that Blaine Charizard comes back to PSA 10, I'll keep it just because I like first edition PSA 10 Charizards. But a lot of this other stuff, if it comes back a grade higher than what I have in my own personal collection, then what I'll do is I'll send it, or I'll check what I have, of course, and um, I'll swap it out. So if I have a 9 in this card in my collection, and this one comes back a 10, I'll put the 10 in my collection, and then I'll sell the 9. The collector in me wants me to keep everything, keep all the cards, but it's just it's so hard to do. And that's really not how you can, I mean, it's, it's hard to run a business that way. You have to be able to separate what you're collecting and what you're going to be selling. A lot of times I make purchases that I want to keep, but really if I'm keeping it, I can't make the purchase. So what you, so what you have to do is you make the purchase <coughs> with the sole intention of only reselling. And even if it's just a small amount, if it's a, if it's a quick item to sell, you just got to let it go. Got a couple more stacks here. Now we're moving into the legendary collection, reverse holographics. Got most of this set, if not the whole set, reverse holographic PSA graded. It's not a 10 set by, by any means. I think it's fairly high grade. I think it's over a 9. We're right at a 9. But a lot of stuff I can still upgrade. So to me, this is a, a fun set for me because. I want a full PSA 10 set, but I don't have to have one. But and that's where it, it can be fun collecting and making purchases because I'll send off all the stuff that's worth PSA grading. And if anything comes back that's better than what I have, I just swap it out. And then I sell the other one that's of a lower grade. Usually the lower grade is still high enough to where it's going to make money back. It's just a regular Mew there. It's not the Gata. Which I think I've got two or three goddess lined up. They're just not in this in this box. Again, everything you've seen so far. I mean, this is all from one of the shoe boxes. So I've got four other boxes that are actually really packed and full. This one was about two thirds full. Got some ruby and sapphire EXs. I think this one comes from a recent collection. The guy brought it to me. I mean, he had everything so sorted, so detailed. And, you know, that's good in a way. In a, in a, from a seller standpoint, it can be really bad because I have to unsort all of that stuff. I have to take everything out of cases, out of the binders, sort it by addition, and especially condition. A lot of times I can sell cards for a little bit higher in my store than what other people sell it for just because I'm really strict on my condition. In my opinion, some people may not feel that same way, but... Usually I try to keep my conditions a lot more strict than what PSA does. So I'm not going to always be perfect just like PSA. So I mean, I may screw up on cards here and there, but especially if the card is worth more than two or three bucks, I try to really examine the condition of it and make sure that it is either accurate or I'm, what I'm describing it as is much less than the actual condition so that you can be a little bit surprised when you get it. I've started reselling played condition cards. I'd stopped doing that for the longest time, but I realized there's still a demand for those cards. You just have to make sure you take pictures of the front, take pictures of the back, and they give a, a little bit better description of what's going on there. So I try to, if there's a crease, I try to make sure that that's known. And if there's you know, something that's hard to see in the photos, I try to make sure that's known. And usually what I do is I put something like, there's also heavy edge wear and scratches prevalent. Even if there's not, I try to put that in there so that they know that they're buying a played card and they shouldn't expect something that would be graded. A recent collection that I bought, it was about a $5,000 collection. He had um, just about one of every like really rare card, all the way from first edition base set through, it was probably one of the last X and Y sets. He thought his collection was a little better shaped than... Um, than what it actually was, but the fact that I was still able to pull four or five first edition holographics out of it that I thought could be graded, I mean, that's that's really a, a, a good eye. It's hard to find raw first edition base set holographics now unless it comes from a collection that just hasn't been touched. This was a collection that had been pieced together. And as you can see, I'm grading a lot of the jungle holographics. I had a lot of the Team Rockets in there as well. And then I've still got another stack to work on that I'm going to show you where... Uh, 
get some more stuff. If you guys are wondering where the Q&A video is, I didn't really get that many questions. Uh, the questions that I got from y'all in the comments or messages, a lot of it had to do with business and eBay stuff. So what I did was I created a, um, a thread on E4 that gives a lot of selling tips and tips or links that you can use while for selling on eBay and PayPal and stuff. So if you go on there, um, you might be able to find it under my activity and check it out. And, I mean, there's a lot of helpful stuff in there if you're looking for like how to work with feedback and work with eBay and phone numbers that work better. All that should be in there. Kind of goes through the process of how I sell things. Like, like I talk about the printer I use. The printer I use for U.S. postage, the printer I use for international postage, and I differentiate that, for example, because the uh, I use a Dyma twin turbo label printer for U.S. postage and for address labels. It's a lot easier to use. It prints with heat. You never have to worry about ink, and then you never have to worry about cutting anything out because it just it's a label and it pops right out. And it's really cheap per label. When I ship with envelopes. If you guys pay full price for stamps, you might want to stop doing that because you don't have to buy stamps at the post office. You can buy stamps here on eBay. I, I know people that sell them through email that offer really good discounts. I mean, there's even if you, you're only buying, say, 100 stamps, I mean, you can get bulk discounts to where they're only like 40 bucks. Sometimes you can find them on eBay as cheap as $30 for 100 stamps. For me, I've got a guy who pretty much perpetually supplies me for 26 cents and that's a stamped envelope and that's with the pull strip so I mean I'm not going to go to the post office and pay 50 cents for a stamp when I can get them for half the price if I buy say 10,000 all at once that's a lot to purchase at once so that's why I said there are ways to buy smaller amounts but the smaller amounts you buy then the less of a discount you're going to be able to get that one's kind of off-centered maybe that's why I had it I'd probably send those in as um, miscuts I believe that did come from that same collection because in addition to having one of most of the ultra rares he did have a lot of other random stuff it was several boxes and that transaction was super easy he said hey man I'm gonna ship it to you and he shipped it to me I analyzed it within a few hours and sent him a price and he's like alright man I'll take it and he ended up sending me some more stuff I believe and then I believe there's another box that he wants to ship that's the easiest way for me to price a collection of course, you're more than welcome to send me emails, and we'll do our best to get it taken care of through email. But if you trust me enough to send me your collection, I can give you a much more accurate price if I get to see everything in person, because I can analyze condition. I don't have to assume. <clears throat> and I can also check your collection for random cards that would be worth a lot more money. When I buy through pictures and uh, just random binders and stuff, I'm, I'm not going to assume mint. Even if you tell me your collection is mint, you, you can't do that because most people don't even know what mint is. And I'm not going to, I'm not trying to bash all of you saying that you don't know what mint is. But for the most part, if you're, if you bought from eBay or Troll and Toad or anywhere, you know that condition is very, very subjective. Even when you get stuff from PSA, it's very subjective. And one little nick can take a, a very expensive card down thousands of dollars. So that's why I like to analyze in person, and that's how I can give the best quote. But anyways, at this time, I'm actually pretty strapped. So if you're looking to send me a collection, message me first, because if it's really high-end, I may not even be able to purchase it at the moment. Just because there have been a couple more huge collections come through, and um, I'm working on purchasing those. The, um, the base set boxes some of you saw on Instagram several months back. Like, for instance, I, I think I bought 12 of those or something like that. And while I may have more funds available, I try to limit how much money I still spend out on these, this kind, these kind of purchases. Because you have to limit how much money is coming in and how much you're putting out. you got to keep the, the business float because if you don't sell something, then you can't really use it as a deduction for that year cost of goods sold is what you deduct. So if you don't sell it, it's going to be a deduction somewhere else down the road and you end up paying taxes on that income anyways. But we're coming up to the end of the video. I've got maybe another 15 cards or so that I'm pulling in here. If you saw something interesting that I was grading and you're wondering why I'm grading it, feel free to send me a, send me a message or just post down there in the comments like, 
hey man, why are you grading a, or grading a $1 Team Rockets Meowth or a Ditto Pikachu that I can find somewhere for 50 cents? And I can give you some insight to that. But anyways, if you're looking for cards to purchase, as always, you can go to my link down in the description for TCA Gaming. Um, I have a eBay store where I sell most of the physical cards. However, if you do play the online game, I sell instant delivery digital codes. A lot of stuff stays sold out, like the, the Magikarp Waylord GX with 300 HP. Man, kids are just loving that thing. I'm sold out of code now, but I will be getting more in next week. And then I do have the card for sale on eBay as well. And again, it's just flying off the shelves. But if you have questions about that kind of stuff or you're wondering how I work with shipping or if I can do you a better deal through PayPal invoice, I could probably work something better for you. But it, it will need to be beneficial for both of us. So just send me a message. You can uh, email me directly. I try to respond fast as I can during business days. And if I don't, just be patient. I'll get back to you. You're more than welcome to continue sending me follow-up emails. It won't bug me. But this is the last card in the video. Like I said, that was just one shoebox full of cards that I had that I planned to grade. When I say shoebox, that's just the type of BCW box that um, the name is given to it. But anyways, I appreciate you guys for watching the video. I hope it wasn't too boring. But I was trying to give you something that was a little bit longer since I hadn't given you a video in a while. Thanks for watching.